We are in the sixth semester offering a studio focusing on tall building design. This has been a collaborative effort between North Carolina State University's School of Architecture and Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Each semester, personnel from SOM have co-taught and done reviews in the studio. The first two semesters were taught with the Chicago office of SOM. The last four semesters have been taught with the San Francisco office of SOM. The depth of the team that SOM has made available is extraordinary, involving three design partners, chief engineer of the San Francisco office, Mark Sarkeesian, principal designer, architectural designer, Leo Chow, from the San Francisco office, and William Baker, the chief engineer in the Chicago office of SOM. It's also involved three other project architects, three other structural engineers, two engineering specialists in sustainability, and an architectural engineer. All of these people have made very significant contributions to the creation and development of this studio. Personnel from SOM San Francisco have made an average of seven person visits to North Carolina State University per semester since they began teaching in the studio. In addition to the on-site reviewers, every review involves SOM personnel who participate by teleconferencing from wherever they happen to be in the world at the time of the review. Each semester, the studio class spends three and a half days in San Francisco. Two and a half days are spent visiting the site from, for which they will be designing a building. Significant architectural precedents, important urban spaces, and other iconic structures such as the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. One full day is spent meeting with SOM personnel in their office. This meeting at SOM is a crucial part of the studio that establishes the relationship between the students and the key SOM personnel with whom they will be working for the entire semester. This meeting sets the tone for everything that comes afterwards. The studio focuses on the design of tall buildings that provide wonderful life quality for the building occupants that engage and enhance the urban fabric of which they are a part, that are efficient in the use of urban space, energy, and materials, and that are economical for the building occupants. There are 10 primary design foci for the studio, which include the obvious ones, such as structure, vertical and horizontal circulation, and views of the outside world for the occupants of the building. In addition to those, the students should address natural light for the use of interior illumination, choosing glazing exposures that avoid excess solar gains during the cooling season, incorporating ventilating for life quality and in the case of San Francisco for cooling purposes, systems integration to reduce interstitial floor volumes, integration of the public and private realms, thermal envelope integrity, which includes providing high thermal resistance, avoiding excessive envelope area, and avoiding thermal bridging. And finally, the students should define and articulate whatever strategies they have chosen for form generation, other than those that are inherent in the issues outlined above. The students are also allowed to pick secondary design foci from another list. Some of the, of the student teams choose those. Some choose to stick with the 10 primary design foci outlined here. In recent years, North Carolina State University architecture students have won several recognitions for tall building design. 
Zara Mirian took first prize nationally in the AISC ACSA Steel Design Competition. Shauna Hammond finished fourth out of 357 international entries in the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat International Design Competition. Kelsey Morrison and Samuel Berner took first prize in the AI Triangle Design Competition. And we had multiple shortlisted projects in the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat International Design Competition. Among the in informational resources are two required textbooks, one titled Designing Tall Buildings, Structure is Architecture by Mark Sarkeesian. Mark Sarkeesian developed this book to support studios that he taught in collaboration with his SOM colleagues at Stanford, UC Berkeley, and other institutions on the West Coast. It is the prime source of information regarding structures for our tall building studio. In addition to that, the students are expected to be familiar with architectural structures written by me, Wayne Place. This book is filled with great precedents, which were selected specifically to be helpful to architecture students. And many of these precedents came directly from SOM projects. Among the other resources are lectures by SOM personnel, resource documents provided by SOM personnel, books gathered from the library by the students, which contain a wealth of precedents, and information gathered from the internet. And the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat Online is a particularly rich source of precedents and information on tall buildings. Because of time constraints, uh, what I am going to show you is less than a third of the student projects. Also, we cannot focus on all issues related to these designs, so I am going to fo focus on a single theme, that being that a tall building requires breadth to provide the lever arm for resisting the overturning moment of horizontal forces of wind and seismic disturbances. So we want a big base to our building. On the other hand, life quality for the building occupants requires that all the occupied spaces be close enough to the building envelope to provide good views of the outside world and to admit natural light. The design challenge of providing both structural breadth and access to environmental resources is further intensified if we want to use natural ventilation to enhance the sense of connection to the outside world. And this challenge becomes extreme if we want sufficient ventilation air for purposes of cooling the building. In designing residences for the San Francisco climate, it is possible to get by with no mechanical cooling if significant amounts of ventilation air are provided to all of the occupied spaces. In this design process, particularly for San Francisco, we are going after natural ventilation as a substitute for mechanical cooling, which saves both on energy consumption, but also on the initial cost of the building. Kimberly Johnson and Daniel Sayad responded to this design challenge by making the building a thin vertical slab one unit deep, thereby accommodating ample cross, cross ventilation, shown here, between the north facade and the south facade, providing bilateral lighting, and providing 360-degree views of the city through the two facades, one facing south and the other facing north. The total distance from this side to that is 50 feet. This is the corridor for horizontal circulation to access all the living units. This is a sleeping loft 
which allows the opening of windows which accommodate cross ventilation while still maintaining privacy and security. This is the initial version of the building showing the external diagrid that provides both gravity support and resistance to horizontal forces. The building was to be 560 feet high and only 50 feet deep in the shallow direction, which produces a ratio of height to thickness of 11.2, which is above the proportions that are generally regarded as structurally efficient or economical. These are achievable proportions, but not necessarily the most economical. And one of our goals was to produce economical accommodations for the people living in the building. It was decided to explore improving the proportions of the structure by adding diagonal bracing elements. So here we have the original thin slab building. Here we have that same building with these uh, two bracing struts. These long bracing, these long bracing elements need to be braced themselves, which led to the idea of a bracing diagrid on each side of the building, right here and right here. These slender diagrids also needed to be braced against buckling perpendicular to the plane of the diagrid. This line of inquiry led eventually to the idea of a space truss structure with an octess truss geometry on its sloped face. Since the structure was becoming quite complex and expensive, it was decided to give it an architectural function by supporting elevated gardens for growing food. This is a close-up view. In green, you see the garden spaces here, and then these links, which were bridges from the main living tower out to the garden spaces. These occurred every four units in the building. This is a view from a slightly different uh, direction. which shows that the bridge is supported on both sides. So there's an outer and an inner diagrid, which are also the gravity support for the bridges that link the building out to the garden spaces. At this angle, the rafter trusses and lateral trusses become apparent. So you'll see this truss work in the floor here, the truss work on these sloped faces, and truss work here that links the outer cord members with the inner cord members on these sloping rafter trusses. And this is a slightly different angle. This sort of emphasizes the outer or top cord members and the inner or bottom cord members of these sloped rafter trusses. And all of this is in the form of a space frame, which not only can resist forces from side to side and up and down the building, but also has good diaphragm action to assist in lateral bracing against wind load, in this case, in this direction, parallel to the sloped face. This image shows the geometry of the gardens. These are the gardens here and here. And these are the bridges leading to the gardens. Here you see the sun angle for the summer solstice, the equinox, and the winter solstice. And in this particular diagram, we've drawn a bunch of lines that are parallel to the sun direction at midday, at midsummer. Uh, and you'll notice that 
these rays are all absorbed on the garden surface. The first ray that manages to escape and slide by that garden gets picked up by the next garden down. And that garden goes all the way out until we get to this ray, which slides by the garden, but then gets picked up by the next garden down. In other words, the depth and vertical spacing of the gardens assures that the gardens will be in full sun during all times of year and that they will intercept all of the sun at midday at the summer solstice, thereby providing beneficial shading for the south facade of the building. In other words, none of this light is arriving at the south facade of the living units and therefore it is not contributing to any kind of solar load uh, during the hot months of the year. This image shows the uh, winter sun angles, and you'll notice substantial amounts of that light are now arriving at the south facade, which, they pro which provides brightness and warmth to the living spaces during the winter time. A structural analysis was performed on the thin slab building shown here and on the building braced by the space frame with elevated gardens. This view is from the southwest showing the thin slab building on the left and the brace building on the right. Um, we're going to examine this building under a wind load towards the north. So this is the south facade. We're going to look at wind towards the north which is going to conspire with the gravity loads to produce very high compression forces in the diagrid on the north face of the building down near the bottom of the building. So in order to understand that analysis and see the results of it, we're going to flip our view by 180 degrees. So here we're viewing from the southwest. We're going to view from the northeast, which looks like this. So we have our braced building here in our thin slab building over there. And this is the north face of the brace building and the north face of the thin slab building. These yellow flags shown here, which are off to the side of the members, indicate the compression stress in the diagrid members on the north side of the two versions of the building. Initially, all the members in the brace building and all the members in the thin th slab building were sized for strength under full factored gravity load plus factored wind force towards the north, both of which are causing compression in the diagrid members on the north side of the structure. In sizing for strength, the diagrid members in the thin slab building, these members right here, had to be much heavier than the diagrid members in this building because of the leverage benefits associated with the wider base in the braced building. Then those strength optimized buildings were simulated for deflection under wind force. So you'll see the deflection here and the deflection there. Gray lines indicate the shape of the building with no wind load. Blue lines indicate the deflected shape of the building under wind load. These deflections are exaggerated graphically to allow us to see these effects more clearly. For the strength optimized thin slab building right here, the deflection was four times the recommended limit based on the serviceability guideline from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Making this thin slab building four times stiffer requires using four times as much steel in the diagrid. In other words, the, the slender nature of the thin slab building is causing the sizing of the members to be powerfully governed by stiffness rather than strength which is producing a very inefficient structure. In contrast, the structural simulations of the braced building 
indicate that the strength optimized version already meets the stiffness criterion set forth by the American Society of Civil Engineers. It was found that the entire structural system in the brace building required substantially less steel than the diagrid in the thin slab building. It is worth noting that this design concept would rarely work in the kinds of urban environments with which we normally operate, where the building would be surrounded by other tall buildings that would rob it of the sunlight required for the hanging gardens. In this particular case, this building design had a large urban park to the south which would assure good solar access throughout the lifetime of the building. Daniel Goldstein and Kevin Diamond also used a thin slab building concept to get cross ventilation, bilateral light, and views on both sides of the living unit. And again, they had a facade facing south with a circulation corridor here and a facade facing north. They designed two thin slab buildings, this one and this one, which were similar in design and construction. And then they laced them together with truss work between the two so that the two parts are mutually braced and mutually stiffened. The truss work consists of buckling restrained braces that absorb energy in an earthquake. The two slender towers are flexible enough that they will not be damaged in the earthquake and they will hold the vertical while the damaged buckling restrained braces are replaced after the earthquake has subsided. Kelsey Morrison and Samuel Berner created two towers, uh, each a single residential unit deep. This one right here and that one right there and they were designed to be tilted together at the top so that they would brace each other. Between the two towers is a vertical atrium. That's the full height of the building facing west. The prevailing west wind in San Francisco ventilates the building via this atrium, which opens completely to the west exposure and is closed on the east side so that the atrium is overpressured to drive ventilation air out through the living units on the north and south side. At the base of the tower is a large mall that engages the city fabric. For their design, Kelsey and Samuel were awarded the AIA Triangle Award. Sarah Nurani and Fuad Fazi also overpressured the core of their building by providing a wide opening towards the west, right here, from which the overwhelming prevailing winds come in San Francisco. Closing off the east side of the building, of the building core, amplifies the pressure, which is then used to drive ventilation air through the units on the north and south side. When ventilation air is not needed for cooling, the east side is opened up and the air is driven through the core of the building where it's concentrated and focused and used to drive wind turbines. Among the interesting explorations that Sarah and Fouad, Fouad conducted was they looked at two different diagrid patterns for the north and south facade. Uh, in each case, this is a view of the north facade of the building. In this image on the left, it's based on the Fibonacci series, and the one on the right is based on a modified Mitchell truss. They went through and did the analysis of both of these structural systems. They also mock them up well enough that they could make an aesthetic judgment between them. 
As in previous examples, Sarah and Fouad's building is broken up into slender vertical portions that are connected together by seismic damping elements. This image shows two perpendicular views of the steel framing, this one looking towards the north and this one looking towards the west. In the image on the left, there are two untriangulated bays here and here which incorporate beams with pin-fused joints at each end as a mechanism for absorbing seismic energy. So this shows that pin-fuse, which is like a drum brake on old cars. There would be another one on the other end in a really extreme seismic event. This joint would rotate, friction would resist that, and energy would be absorbed and converted to heat in this element. After the earthquake is over, these bolts could be loosened. Uh, these slender vertical elements, which would be undamaged during the quake, would then restore verticality to the building and these uh, seismic fuses re-bolted. In the image on the right, Eccentric brace frames were used as the seismic energy absorbers in the center bay. We're going to switch things around a little bit now and talk about Chicago uh, rather than San Francisco. Ben Menaki and Phil Smith addressed the design challenge of providing both structural breadth and access to environmental resources by separating the building into four slender cores, shown here these vertical cores, and then connecting them together with these horizontal elements, which are moment connected to the verticals to stabilize the slender cores. These moment framed elements provide horizontal circulation for the occupants of the building between the cores, thereby facilitating multiple means of fire egress. HVA systems were also housed in these horizontal bridging elements, facilitating vertical flow of environmental air through the mechanical cooling system or mechanical cooling equipment. So environmental air would rise up through, the fans would drive it through the equipment, that hot air would then tend to rise and move away from the mechanical system. This method is more efficient than the customary solution in tall buildings of bringing air in horizontally and expelling it horizontally at mechanical floors. In those systems, more fan power is required if the fan is having to work against the uh, prevailing wind at any given moment, but also the system will function less effectively if the wind is interfering with the operations of the mechanical equipment. Floors in the living units were hung off of the slender cores. A structural analysis was performed to decide the appropriate angle for the diagonal support elements for suspending the floors. So here we have those suspension elements which hold up the floors. We looked at a slope corresponding to one vertical out to the support point, all the way up to 20 floors of vertical dimension, and then out to the support point. For one story of vertical dimension on these suspension elements, the, sh the angle was too shallow, resulting in excessive force and excessive deflection. For 20 stories of vertical dimension, the stress path was too long, resulting in excessive deflection. The optimum vertical dimension turned out to be 8 to 10 stories, similar to what's shown here. This image shows one of the slender cores with elevators and a vertical chase for ventilation air around it. 
these vertical air shafts had to wrap around the core in order to supply air to living units on all sides of the cylinder core. This is a rendering of their design from the Chicago River. And this is their physical model, which was made out of plexiglass and about three and a half feet tall. This is a rendering at the base of the building showing the elevated retail mass with super graphics to make its purpose clear. These lobby spaces were mainly glass enclosure at the base and there was a public park level made available uh, right above the uh, retail mass and then from there on up are the living units and this is the Chicago River. Zara Mirian had a very challenging site at 350 Mission Street in San Francisco. The site is oriented 45 degrees off the cardinal directions. So it's four corners. The four corners of the site are pointing north, south, east, and west. So this shows the building surrounded by other tall buildings around it, which already exist. For the new building, the only significant sources of natural light or beam sunlight from overhead that manages to slip down between the tall buildings and the south corner of the site where the height of this trans bay building is low enough to let light into the building site. And by the way, this is an extremely important facility for the city that's currently being built. It will never go taller than it is. Um, and therefore, there is a reasonable expectation that there will be fairly good solar exposure on this corner. To tap into the natural light at the south corner of the site, double height communal spaces were distributed up the south edge of the building. These spaces allow the building occupants to enjoy the warmth and the cheer of the winter sun. To harvest any overhead Direct beam sunlight, Zara included a facade which bulges outward. So there's slope glazing here that collects sunlight. That sunlight is bounced off of a tracking mirror, which sends the light across the ceiling and provides natural light deep in the space. To address, address the structural issues, Zara used a moment frame structure supplemented with buckling restrained diagonal braces at the perimeter of the building. The buckling restrained braces would absorb most of the seismic energy. The moment frame would be flexible enough to avoid yielding so that it could hold the building vertical while damaged braces are being replaced after the earthquake. For her design, Zara was awarded the first place in the National Steel Design Competition. Eliani Lopez and Jason Hines addressed the design challenge of providing both structural breadth and access to environmental resources by using a cruciform shape, which produces eight corner units rather than the usual four corner units provided by the more customary square plan. So here you see a square plan. Parts of it are cleaved away. It still has good structural breadth, but much more exposed surface and all the spaces are closer to the outside. Then portions of this tower were truncated at various levels. The tower became tapered and ultimately uh, incorporated a twist. The twist was inspired by the swirling winds in Chicago and by the confluence of the three rivers, which you see here in this model of the building. It's a spectacular site, which is occupies an incredibly important position in the overall fabric of the city of Chicago. This is a rendering of that building. And this shows some of the results of structural analysis, which indicated that torsion is exerted under the, on the structure, even under pure vertical forces. So you'll notice some yellow flags indicating compression, but
with some cyan flags indicating tension. You would not normally expect under pure gravity force to see any tension forces. And so this does reduce somewhat the efficiency of the building. However, the exterior diagrid structure addresses these torsional influences as well as the more conventional shear and overturning moment issues. This is another structure designed for Wolf Point in Chicago at the confluence of the three rivers. This is one of the rare super tall buildings designed in the studio. The students discovered how much extra volume they have in this extremely wide base, which was a serious design challenge in terms of how they allocate spaces to avoid un unused spaces in the core of the building. They did eventually resolve these issues in a very nice design. The structure is rendered on the left here. This is a physical model on the right, which was about three feet tall, made of acrylic. In the middle of the image shows some of the atrium spaces that are scattered up the facade. This is a public space at the top of the building, giving wonderful 360 degree views of Chicago. Joshua Stevens addressed the design challenge of providing both structural breadth and access to environmental resources by giving his building an H shape in plan, which you see right here. He also used a diagrid consisting of intersecting elliptical arches, which you see here and here. This provided a very lofty quality to the overall structure and opened up the interior of the building, which you see down here and at these various levels of the building. The inter interlaced elliptical arches are reminiscent of a Mitchell truss and are a very efficient way of handling the structure in this building. Shauna Hammond addressed the design challenge of providing both structural breadth and access to environmental resources using a traditional technique of expanding the building outward and boring out the core to produce an atrium space. The design was inspired by basket weaving, where strength is achieved by using continuous members woven through each other. The normal rattan for baskets is replaced by laminated veneer lumber for the building. The laminated veneer lumber alternates direction at each layer of each joint. So here we have a continuous member on the level below it. The member is continuous in this direction and below that it's continuous in that direction. So at every joint, half of the material is continuous in both directions. LVL addresses the issue of embodied energy by using a material the sequesters carbon. It also addresses the seismic issues by using a material that has a very high strength to weight ratio and that is very effective in damping oscillatory disturbances. So here we see the atrium here and the occupied spaces on each side. In this image shows the structural system and the physical model. And this physical model was a real marvel. It was over three feet tall. It was super lightweight and very strong and very stiff and represented an excellent proof of concept. This is a view out from an individual unit. And this is just to point out that in the case of wood, these structural members become fairly large because the material is inherently not very dense. These elements provide the opportunity to create some in-between spaces. So there's the potential to seal this off and make this some sort of uh, uh, greenhouse space on the boundary of the building. Ventilation strategies and daylighting strategies were incorporated in the atrium. Here we have air being convectively driven up. 
Uh, in this case, there are tracking mirrors similar to the ones that Zara used in her project, except in this case, they're accepting light through the roof aperture and then projecting it down vertically in the space. There are crystalline uh, diffusers there, which serve not only to spread light around the space, but they also provide sculptural elements in that large volume. Ample recreation and retail opportunities were provided along the very public waterfront, which is a crucial resource for the citizens of Chicago. Shauna Hammond finished fourth internationally in the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat uh, International Design Competition. Joel Lubell and Logan Knox undulated the perimeter of their building to enhance the interface with the outside world. The interior spaces were sized and shaped to assure good daylight penetration into the center of the spaces and a very sturdy circular concrete core handles the sheer overturning moment and torsion on the building. This is a view of the tower through the retail podium at the base of the building. So let me go back and point out this was office space down below, residential up above, and a retail mall um, on the back side of the structure. Jenny Zhu and Andres Barrera also undulated the perimeter of the building, in their case using an eight-pointed star to increase the interface with the outside world. This created eight exterior corners, each of which was outfitted with fully retractable glass at the point to allow cross ventilation and panoramic views that are uninterrupted even by glass. Such expansive openings require protection from the elements, especially rain and the hot overhead sun. It is possible when climate conditions are right to produce absolutely wonderful architecture with no walls. What we do require is a roof with wide overhangs, shown here, to protect us from rain and the hot overhead summer sun. We see this architectural theme expressed in cultures all around the world, wherever the weather is good enough for at least a few months of the year to make it worthwhile. This is a shelter that's part of the Forbidden City. Um, these columns are moment connected top and bottom so that they are able to not only support the gravity loads from the roof, but to resist lateral forces also. The lack of any walls maximizes cross ventilation and openness to views. This architectural theme was adapted by the Chinese very early in their culture to produce more versatile architecture intended for year round occupancy, even in the challenging climate of Northern China. This is a moment framed structure consisting of vertical columns and moment connections top and bottom. The walls are not structural, even for resisting the lateral forces of wind or seismic. When the walls are closed down, they provide protect protection during the cold times of the year. During the warm times of year, the walls can be opened up to become very transparent to the breeze. While being very transparent to the breeze, the lattice work in these walls offers some visual privacy and security. And the wide overhangs protect all the occupied space from the rain and the summer sun. Such a structure can be embedded in nature or it can be elevated above the natural terrain enhancing the sense of security and providing the lofty long view. This can be accomplished by placing the structure on the top of a hill. 
or by creating a tall building, such as we see here. Even in this tall building, the wide overhang has been provided for every story, making every story a wonderful spatial experience. Imagine spending your days on one of these upper floors, enjoying the long views in every direction, the cross ventilation, no matter what direction the breeze is blowing in, illumination from all sides, and the wonderful sense of shelter provided by the wide overhangs. This particular structure has denser walls and less sense of openness that was, than was provided in the previous uh, images. To reach these heights, the classical Chinese wood construction required structure throughout the core of the tall building. So there's a lot of vertical wood in here. And so it's not as open as we would like in terms of the occupied space. However, the sense of potential and aspiration is expressed in the structure. This aspiration is also expressed in other Chinese designs, such as this lantern. Notice the lack of any walls and the moment frame with columns no larger than necessary. Of course, one could say that this is more a manifestation of the optical optimization of the lantern. However, it is hard to escape the sense that this lantern expresses a clear architectural aspiration. With modern materials and structural systems, this architectural aspiration can be achieved with wide open interior and minimum obstructions to views, light, and cross breezes. The question becomes, what is the best way to scale this up to a more practical tall building that could be widely applicable? So this is an example of how it might be done. These spaces are intended to be communal spaces with restaurants or gymnasiums or whatever. Each of these points represents part of a living unit. Notice the, the suspension elements that come down from each side from the tops of those columns, which support this floor while pulling as much of the structure as possible back from the exterior boundary of the space. Fully retractable walls allow for huge amounts of ventilation and unobstructed views. Double units, which might occupy two of these points, or triple units, which occupy three of these points, get even better cross ventilation. Many student projects use towers with an L-shaped footprint so that the two slender parts of the tower could brace each other. One example of this approach was this design by Grant Wiley and Marty Needham, which used a distinctive diagrid structure that you can see here. The delicate elements that look like metal trees are tipped with mini turbines, turbines to harvest wind that's focused between the towers. These turbines and the trees planted between the buildings are also intended to slow down the wind sufficiently that the space between the buildings will not be uncomfortable for human occupancy. Excessive wind speed is a major concern in San Francisco where the cool air and high wind speeds can cause discomfort in outdoor spaces even during the warmest parts of the summer. This is an interior view of an office space showing how the narrow space allows excellent penetration of the daylight. Grant and Marty did a detailed computerized structural analysis to size the members in their structure. They also welded up a one quarter scale physical model of a joint in that diagrid structure. This joint detail was based on drawings from the Poly International Building in Beijing, 
which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Xin Xiao Zhang and Mo Kuan Lin also used an L-shaped building footprint to form a shallow building that is stabilized by the two cylinder parts bracing each other. A building with an L-shaped plan presents space planning challenges, particularly near the intersecting corner of the L-shape. This team resolved those issues well and created a really wonderful interior volume. And this is a rendering of one of their office spaces. So in conclusion, the studio demonstrates that it is possible for an architecture program that has traditionally focused on buildings of only a few stories to successfully launch a studio dealing with tall, tall buildings. The contribution of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill was profoundly important in propelling this process forward. It's also beneficial when there are students who are motivated to participate in a groundbreaking enterprise. And finally, a faculty challenge, champion is also important. Such studios be benefit from refinement over time, which makes it crucial to have a faculty member who is willing to commit multiple years to the effort. This lecture just hit the highlights of some of the projects as they relate to a particular design theme. It also represents less than a third of the projects that have been executed to date. There are also other design themes that could be profitably discussed if time permitted.